welcome everybody. Um, we're excited to bring some amazing guests today to talk about how we can hold our workplace together, um, especially when, <laughs> especially when the world feels like it's falling apart. So, if we thought that 2020 was rough, we had 2021, and then 2022 we thought things would be better. And then Putin entered the chat, so <laughs> um, pretty pretty rough year. Um, so today we're here to talk about how do we lead our people through crisis. We've had a pandemic, we've had insurrection at the Capitol, we've had racial injustice, um, and now we have this new and horrific war in the Ukraine. And it's impossible to think that all of these things happen in isolation, that these things aren't impacting the people within our workplace. Um, so things have been tough. They've been tough for mental health. Um, now they're also tough on physical well-being for our employees. Usually when we do these webinars, they're a bit of a commercial for hone. Um, today the tone's a bit more somber, and I really want this panel to be focused on the discussion at hand. Um, also, we're making a donation on behalf of Hone to UNICEF um, in the names of all the wonderful panelists who volunteered to spend their time with us today. So without further ado, let's introduce our guests. Um, Let's start with Alina uh, Vandenberg. So she's the co-founder and um, chief experience officer at Chili Piper, a platform that's dedicated to inbound conversion for B2B companies. Um, at Hohen, we use Chili Piper. We love it. We love her team. Um, but Chili Piper has employees in Ukraine and in Russia and in surrounding countries. Um, so she's going to share some of her experiences today. We've got Alyssa Cohn. She's the author of From Startup to Grown Up. She was um, wonderful enough to talk with us uh, maybe a couple weeks ago about her new book, but she's the number one startup coach in the world. Um, she's been featured in New York Times, BBC, and Bloomberg, guest lecturer at Harvard, MIT, Cornell, and Henley Business School. Um, we're also lucky enough to be joined by Dawn Sherifan. Um, she's the SVP of People at Slack. She teaches a, in the business department at San Francisco State. She's also a certified coach, experienced dealing with large organizations um, uh, and with lots of experience through change. Um, and finally, I'd love to also introduce Tatiana Mamut. Um, Tatiana is originally from Ukraine um, and from three generations of Soviet professional women. She's a Silicon Valley leader. She's an entrepreneur. She's an intrapreneur. She's also an advisor to startup founders and C-suite executives. Um, and Tom, who's Hone CEO, uh, um, who I will give over the reins to, um, to lead this conversation. So um, for everybody who's attending, for, for all of our attendees who are live, please enter your questions. Uh, there's a Q&A feature in Zoom. Um, if you drop your questions in there, I'll make sure we get them to the panelists at the end. We're reserving time for Q&A, so please put your questions there. I'll also be monitoring the chat. Um, so with that, Tom, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks, Matt. Um, <clears throat> really grateful to everyone for being here. Um, Alyssa, Dawn, Tatiana, um, and uh, Alina. Thank you so much for um, getting this organized at short notice. Obviously, events are happening in real time. and we wanted to do whatever we can to support our community um, as we navigate these difficult events. So the discussion we wanted to have today is of course grounded in initially what's happening in Ukraine, um, but we also wanna zoom out um, given the other crises that we've experienced over the past few years and you know, unfortunately will likely continue to experience in the years coming, um, you know, how can we handle and lead through crises more generally? Um, so really looking forward to the discussion. Um, you know, great introductions from Matt. I think Tatiana and Alina, just given your personal connections to the region um, that's uh, in all the news headlines right now and the tragic circumstances of the war in Ukraine, I would be curious to ask you, you know, what has been your personal experience of these past few weeks and months, um, given your connections, and then how has that shaped your role um, and mindset as a, as a people leader? Perhaps Tatiana, we can start with you. Sure. Um, I was born in Kharkiv um, in Ukraine, in eastern Ukraine, one of the cities that is being bombed the most. Um, while my immediately fam immediate family is out um, at the start of this war, um, I did have more distant relatives that were there that we were in con contact with. 
Um, they are now in Bulgaria, um, exited through Romania. Originally, we we're going to go to Poland, but the northern route was just too dangerous. And I do, I also was an executive in Moscow for several years. So I have a lot of friends in Moscow. And as soon as the war started, they, um, all the people I knew in Moscow were heartbroken. Um, they changed their profile pictures on Facebook when they still had access to Facebook to black squares. Um, and so I think one of the first things to just really note is that this is not a war of Russia versus Ukraine or Russians versus Ukrainians. It's, it's really about, you know, one person who um, has a particular vision of the world that is uh, highly destructive. And that ego and human ego, in, especially when we allow leaders with large egos to take over any organization, right? It can lead to massive human destruction and suffering. And I think that's the thing that I think gives me in a way hope through this whole um, situation is that we are all uniting um, in many ways as a, as a community, as a world, um, at, in our common humanity, um, as we watch the suffering of, you know, tens of millions of people to say, you know, we are all human and we are all united. And as a, in terms of leadership, right, how do we make sure that we do not allow people with large egos who are self-centered to ever get into power in any organization? and to keep our egos in check. And I think that's one of the things that is really important. Now, I think that's kind of the perspective from, from me um, on the ground. Um, personally, it is devastating to know that I will never ever be able to see the city of my birth ever again, as it was. It may be rebuilt, but it will never be the place that you know, I was born and grew up in. That's a very strange um, feeling. My father has been supporting a, uh, a makeshift bunker um, that's in the, the basement of a theater um, in the center of Hydekov. People felt very safe in that theater up until last night when the theater in Mariupol was um, bombed. And so now they're all trying to figure out how to get out. Um, so, uh, it's, it's been crazy for me, um, personally, uh, communicating with people, trying to figure out how to help, um, being in contact, um, and we can talk about all of that, um, to the extent that you want. Yeah, thank you, Tatiana. I mean, <clears throat> it's, uh, an unimaginable, uh, connection to such a tragic se series of events, and like you say, the country has been changed forever, um, as well as the people that have been affected um, forever. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, this is going to have ramifications for, for decades to come, um, and we're seeing it unfold, you know, in mm -hmm. days. So thank you for, for that, and we'll come back to you in a moment. But Alina, given your heritage from Romania, I'd be curious to hear your perspective and any connections that you've felt uh, to this region and uh, the issues at hand. I am uh, bringing uh, three Alinas to this meeting. Um, one is the Alina that has been shaking and crying uh, for the past couple of weeks. Um, because as a mom with two kids, I see these uh, families broken apart with all the refugees that are coming through the border and the emotions that they have to go through just to find basic needs. Uh, just shelter and me, I, here I am uh, in my office and I have uh, all, all the possible conditions to be safe and they don't. And as a mother, that disturbs me to an extent that is um, not as close as Tatiana because it's not my birth country, but I been in a similar situation in Romania when communism dropped and there was a lot of fighting. Um, people were stupidly fighting each other because right now the Russians and the Ukrainians, they're stupidly fighting each other. They're killing each other for, for what? Um, and 
I was a child when the conflict happened in Romania, but I remember very vividly because there were we had to crawl to go to uh, the bathroom or to go to from one room to another because there were literally bullets flying in the windows of our apartment. And we didn't even know who was shooting whom, like why and, and what, what was going on. So I have that um, memory in, 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 my, in, my, in my brain and it's, it's, it's super troublesome. Um, that, that's Alina, the, the, the mom. Then there's Alina, the person that has gone through similar situation on the ones that the Russians are going through because during communism, we had similar propaganda on TV and we had a similar situation where there was a dictator with a big ego and he was making sure that everybody's indoctrinated to what he wanted them to believe. And, you know, we repeat, you repeat, you repeat, you repeat, and people believe, especially those that are not educated um, uh, to the highest uh, ranks. And um, it was unbelievable for me to, to notice how my own family believed messages that made no sense. I, I was lucky enough to be exposed to a uh, high level of education, but not everybody did. And the more they were exposed to information, even if it was false, they would just believe it. And I see something similar that's happening right now in Russia where those that are educated understand that it's wrong. Those that are part in, in the remote areas and even in Moscow, in, in St. Petersburg, those that have been like listening to the same thing again and again, um, they're in a, in a different state. Um, and it's hard for those that have that understand that this is wrong, know what actions to take so that everybody else rallies around them. And not everybody has the skill to lead this kind of movement. There are some people that are very brave in Russia right now, but not everybody understands how they can leverage their own emotions and then their own disturbance to be able to influence masses of people around them to actually rebel. And I, I've seen that as a child, and I know it was hard for me to want to take action when I didn't have the tools to know what actions to take to have that kind of impact. Um, and then there's Alina, the business leader, we've created this company um, that is now considered a unicorn and, and has a great valuation and has ama amazing employees. How do I make sure that I support them? How do I make sure that I continue to have economical growth so that I can have that support for them? And I have to balance these things where I want them to know that I'm there for you, for, for them, and I and I give them anything I can possibly give, but still run a business and still have economic viability to be able to have the right platform to continue to have that support to, to my employees. So that's kind of like how I look at things. Um, we we're lucky enough that we had the foundation before and we were already doing work on this, uh, on this topic because nonviolence is very, very important to me looking at my uh, upbringing. And I, we take a lot of, uh, um, we're very cautious even internally when we communicate with one another, uh, especially in these very difficult circumstances, how to communicate our needs and our emotions and everything that we're going through in a way that we don't alienate others, even with things that are in between the lines, things that are not read or gestures like rolling of eyes and all these micro gestures that could communicate violence, we're working to annihilate us to the extent that it's possible so that people can have the optimal dialogue when they disagree and then to have the tools that they need to express themselves when they have very strong emotions without having to recourse to saying words that they might regret that they can't take back. Um, the, the importance of, of having the right tools to communicate things that you disagree with, I think is, is hyper important. And especially when you have things that are happening right now with the war, it would have been so much better if the things that Putin cares so strongly about right now would have been solved in other ways with economical measures, with all sorts mm -hmm. of uh, tools in place that would just not resort to killing. I'm mad that this is happening, mad. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Alina. And um, just a really um, another powerful perspective on what's happening. 
especially you know your points around the communication and the kind of the, the media domination that they have um, with state media in Russia and how that can indoctrinate people to think a certain way that we find quite hard to understand. I definitely also really identify with um, you know those conflicting emotions that you mentioned, just kind of the gratitude for you know the safety that we have, um, the, the anger you know what we're seeing. Uh, but also as a business leader, you know, what do we do? Um, you know, what actions are in our sphere of control that we can actually make some small contribution to that? Um, and so, you know, Alyssa, Dawn, I'd love to come to you in a moment, but just given the you know, personal connection that um, Tatiana also has to Ukraine, I wanted to ask her, um, we've talked about the personal connection. Tatiana, how do you think about what is, what is appropriate for companies in the US or internationally that don't necessarily have such close ties, but want to do something like what is appropriate for us to do? Yeah, so I can I can speak from my personal experience. I think Pendo um, has been really amazing um, in the response. So the first thing that happened was the CEO, um, the chief people officer, um, you know, and my boss uh, reached out to me all to say, hey, it must be really hard. Um, I just want to let you know that I'm thinking about you, um, you know, do what you need to do to take care of yourself. Like we have a value um, at Pendo, which is promote life outside work. And people do understand that that's a value and, and managers hopefully understand that recognizing the things that are happening outside of work is an appropriate thing to message with their employees about, right? On my team, I found out that there were two other people on the team that had connections to Ukraine, um, someone who had actually adopted their children from Ukraine. Um, so, and another person who was actually from Belarus, but had relatives in Ukraine. So I reached out to them as well. So I think managers feeling um, like it's appropriate for them to reach out and connect around um, personal topics. Um, I think having a culture that, that encourages that is really important. Um, the other thing is that, um, you know, two people in the organization um, that I know have decided to start a fundraiser. Um, and we've already raised $5,000 internally. Um, hopefully, you know, it'll probably be more than that. And, um, and so they, you know, felt fully empowered, right, to start this fundraiser within our company. And they were, again, immediately, I mean, they came up with it, they posted it <laughs> in Slack, um, and all the executives rallied around them, you know, and a lot, and a lot of us made, you know, matching donations as well to show that this is appropriate behavior in our company, right, that, that there was no question about, you know, when the world needs us, our employees are empowered to use our community in the company to do the right thing. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I, I think I totally agree that first priority is looking after the staff that have those human connections. And in some cases, you know, we have customers at home who had people based in Ukraine. So, you know, clearly their number one priority is their safety uh, and safety of their families. But then also, like you say, leading the culture to show that you know we can talk about these things and we can take action internally using our community the other thing that we felt was important inside Hone was just to let everybody know that we're here to support them you know you only have to turn on the news to feel kind of a, a range of powerful emotions um, and so you know that's okay we understand that people can't be 100 percent focused on work just given everything that's happening and so just letting people know not all hands that they can raise it to colleagues they can raise it to me they can raise it to their managers to to talk it through. Um, so thank you, Tatiana. I mean, Alyssa, it'd be great to talk um, more generally about crises and crisis management um, because we've had a few examples over the past few years. And, you know, I've definitely been in the seat as a CEO thinking, you know, what is appropriate to, to do? How much should we talk about it? How much should we do as a company externally? So we'd love to know the advice that you've given to the many CEOs that you coach. Yep. Thanks, Tom. And Tom, just thank you and Hone for um, really having this important webinar. And thank you so much, Alina and Tatiana, for sharing what you just shared, which is that really personal perspective, as well as that business perspective. I would just echo, especially what Tatiana just said, with, it is a time when crisis comes, it is a time for connected leadership. Now, it's always a time for connected leadership. But when crises hit, it's like helpful for companies to have had 
the muscle and the muscle memory around what it means to be connected as a leader and as a manager. And then there's a whole set of things that that means, which is around having time before meetings, people to do a check-in, acknowledging what's going on. As Tatiana said, and, and, and Tom, as you said, really reaching out to individuals who you know have a personal connection to the crisis. And I would also say having tools to do that. So I am big on manager training. I'm not doing a commercial for home, but I'm big on manager training because any normal adult may not know how to address these really uncomfortable and all too real situations, whether it's the crises that you mentioned before, which are nuanced and complicated in many ways. And this crisis, which feels more real uh, or maybe more straightforward, but in the US, we are kind of disconnected from it. So how do you have the tools to reach out and really be present and be a container so that people can share what's really going on with them, having the understanding of what that means for them and their families. And then I would say that as you know, the leaders and the CEOs, I hope you can still see me. Mm -hmm. I think you can still yep. see me. Okay, yep. good. good. Um, okay, good. Um, for CEOs themselves, to be able to make sure they're communicating to all hands and in small groups and large groups, how they are protecting the health and well-being of their employees. And certainly most of my clients have some connection to Ukraine because they have you know, developers there or you know, a branch there. I have a client in Ukraine. And so how are they really dealing with what are the needs on the ground with those individuals and then letting everybody know that they're doing it because when you do one thing for a group of people that's fantastic but when you let the company know about it that's what builds culture so to me it's a time for communication and connection and the tools to be that kind of a leader yeah absolutely thanks Alyssa and you know in your book you talk about um the, what's the appropriate level of showing emotion as a leader? Because you want to be human, uh, but you also want to, I guess, not convey all of your uncertainties and anxieties to the team because in some, you know, part of the role of a leader is to shoulder that uh, for everyone else. So um, in these kinds of crisis situations, given that you know, we're all affected as humans, how, how, what do you think is appropriate in terms of showing emotion? Yeah, that's a great question. So I do think, you know, showing your humanity is both acceptable and, and frankly appropriate. You know, just now Alina showed us her humanity and sharing the three Alinas. That is honest. And yet um, what I think is important for all of us is also to have emotional self-control, to realize that it is appropriate to acknowledge the heaviness for all of us, the grief for many of us, and um, at the same time, an understanding of how we are still marching forward together. You can't be, you can't be sort of constantly falling apart and still be able to convey that. So I, I always think, but it's certainly true for this time, I always think it's helpful for CEOs and all leaders to, to, to really ask themselves what is needed from the leader in this moment. You know, all mm -hmm. of us are playing a role in some way. So what is needed from the leader in this moment and it's a combination of confidence and strength as well as humanity. And your chinks in the armor allow people to connect with you and show your humanity. That allows them to follow you better. And your confidence and your conviction in still where we're going continues that process of allowing them to follow you. So it's that, it's that fine tune, but I would say that, or that maybe that nuanced you know, set, but I would say it comes back to being intentional for, and, and really asking yourself the question, what is needed by this company from the leader in this moment. Yeah, yep. No, I love that question. It reminds me of another um, uh, mindset where they say, you know, soft heart, but strong spine, like combine the two. Um, Definitely. And, you know, that's the challenge of leadership. So, I mean, Dawn, we're actually just coming off another huge global crisis um, with the COVID pandemic. And Slack was just in an absolutely unique and interesting position given the scale of the company and the dis distribution of your employees, but also the fact that half the world was turning to your product to help them um, continue working through this immediate shift to remote and hybrid work. So I would love to hear your experience of that um, crisis and how you were able to respond. Sure. So first of all, I mean, Slack wasn't unique. We were all caught up in this at the same time. And so we were all learning together and as far as I know, no one else has been through a pandemic before. So, um, well, that is still working, at least at Slack. And so 
you know, for us, we felt the weight of supporting our employees. We felt the weight of supporting, like there's a business opportunity for us to really, um, I don't want to say take advantage, but to really maximize the product to, to, to maximize the business and also support our customers. So we felt the weight in those three ways, the business perspective, the employee perspective, and the customer perspective. And I think that was something, you know, many, hopefully many of you use Slack, but you probably don't use Slack at Slack, which is like Slack on steroids. It's very intense. It's a very intense process. But what we were able to do is take that learning and then pass it on to our employees and our customers. What does that look like? So tactically, what that looked like was one, just showing up with humanity. We told people, remember two years ago, we told people, it's okay if your kid comes on the Zoom call, it's not that big of a deal. Like that was such a big deal two years ago, right? Or, you know what, you don't have to be on camera all day. Let's go off camera. Let's do a walking one-on-one. -on -one. You can set your Slack status to do not disturb. You can set your Slack status to, I'm going for a run or I'm taking care of kids whatever that might be. So we were able to take the learnings from internally with our company, the culture we had already previously built. Cause I think that's the other piece is crises happen, all sorts of different ones we've been talking about, but the deposits to the trust account must be made before the crises happen. Mm -hmm. And that's when you're looking eye to eye in your employees eyeballs and you're saying, I've never been through a pandemic. I don't know how this is gonna go. We thought we'd be back in the office in two weeks but I'm gonna do right as much as I can by you. So please trust me, mm -hmm. right? Leadership is messy. We didn't get it right the whole time. And so I think it's one, depositing in the, in the front end, two, taking our learnings and putting that out to the customer and the community. And third, to be able to say, your space for your humanity. And that was already part of our culture before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, really powerful, thank you. Um, and I, I really liked what you said about transferring learning from what you had developed as a, a culture to teach the rest of the world and, and how they can um, adopt that as well. On that theme, I, I'd just be curious to ask, I mean, have there been any commonalities or learnings from the pandemic that have helped your response to the Ukrainian crisis, given, you know, we're thinking about common lessons between crises, just curious if anything it felt connected or you felt better equipped in any way to handle this because of what's gone before. That was to me? To, to yes. Me. Yeah. I think, I will just tell you as a people leader, my ability to surf in the last two years has increased significantly. So I think that is something where, um, I think leaders, myself included, Sometimes you want to get it right. You want to show up, you know, you want to show up and, and be that thing that the company needs right in that moment. And you can get so focused on getting it right that you kind of get a little bit fear, stuck in fear because you don't want to get it wrong. And so I think one thing that we did learn is how to pivot, how to talk to people. I think, um, you know, Alyssa said it really well, a lot of communication, a lot of talking, a lot of comms, immediate going out. And I think the other thing is, you know, we've now been acquired by Salesforce. Um, so it's a little bit of a different period for us. But the other thing is we're clear on who we are and where our values are, and that hasn't changed. And so, luckily Salesforce is aligned with that, but we just know who we are as a company. And so how we show up, how we do fundraisers, how we show up for, you know, this or that or the other thing has just always been consistent. And so I think knowing who you are as a company and a North Star will help you surf regardless of what the crisis is happening. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, sorry, Tatiana, do you have response? Well, yeah, so I just wanted to um, to chime in on that one because um, I was CPO at Nextdoor in 2019 mm. and 2020. Um, quite a few crises at that point. Um, you know, first we had COVID, right? And on the platform, of course, so Nextdoor, you know, for those of you, um, hopefully all of you use it, but it's a social media platform for neighborhoods and for neighbors to connect with each other. So, you know, massive crises in terms of the COVID lockdown, people looking for local information, then Black Lives Matter protests and that, you know, kind of concentration of local conversations, um, you know, and, and employees also, right, being inc incredibly affected by both of those. And then right after that, we had wildfires in California. And then right after that, we had the 2020 election. So just crisis after crisis. And so um, it was, it was what, we, what I would say we learned is that you can't wait. You have to mm -hmm. respond as things happen. Mm 
Yeah. And, um, and I, you can't wait both with the internal decisions that you make and you cannot wait in terms of the external decisions that we, you make. So yeah. as soon as, um, you know, COVID struck, we were the, the, we were the first platform that created any way for people to help other people locally, right? While other companies waited and tried to figure out what their strategy was and whether they should pivot, we immediately put up the help map right, where neighbors could ask for help. Like we turned that around in a weekend. And then with Black Lives Matter, we immediately said like, we're just taking down, you know, the posts um, that have any kind of racial, racist content or white or, or, you know, all lives matter type of content, right? Like, so, so it was really important. It's really important to just make decisions very quickly um, and not wait because when you wait, you lose the moment, right? And and not doing something is making a conscious decision to not do anything. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing that I really would underline for leaders is waiting means that you have consciously decided not to do anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is a decision that's going to be seen as a decision both internally and externally. Yeah, that, that is a great point. Um, and I also totally agree with the speed of decision-making that you need in those environments. I would be curious, how are those decisions made? Because it sounds like a phenomenal response and a pretty immediate response in multiple times. Was that top down? Was that bottoms up from the team? How did that actually come about? It was both. So again, you have to, I mean, I love the whole, you know, you have to put um, put the deposits in the bank account beforehand. Right. So leadership needs to be open and transparent, which means that you have to have leaders that people know they can go to with their ideas. Mm -hmm. And that means an environment in which people are less worried about hurting each other's feelings or looking good. Mm -hmm. um, and, and an environment where people are much more interested in just saying what they really think and trying to do the right thing all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And that means that people's egos are going to be ruffled, right? And, and, I, and if people haven't read the book, Give and Take by Adam Grant, I think it's absolutely the most important people leadership book ever in the history of the planet, because there are many, many agreeable takers in our organizations. So they seem like nice people, um, but they actually foster environments where people are afraid to speak up. So the answer to your question is we already had an environment where people mm -hmm. were constantly coming to me as the CPO with ideas. You know, um, our, our uh, neighbor, neighborhood leads were constantly emailing me with ideas and um, putting ideas out there. And so there was all, you know, immediately there were all these ideas that were brought. Then we did a quick research project to understand what was the right idea. And then top down, you know, I said, okay, this is the one that we're going to pursue just to get the execution to happen quickly. Yeah. So it was both bottoms up and top down, but it was more the culture and the environment that created that beforehand. Yeah, no, that's great to hear. And I think a couple of themes that are occurring in that were, um, you, know, you need to lay the groundwork before the crisis happens so that you have a culture of high trust and high deposits and openness you know, between leadership and um, you know, the, the team more broadly. Um, and also just, you know, again, trying to be conscious of egos in the workplace and the detrimental effect that they can have versus egoless leadership as far as possible um, to you know, have that openness and, and so that people can come to you. Thanks, Tatiana. Um, so Alina, to shift a little bit and talk about kind of the human side of this internally um, and the emotions that we're all feeling, um, how as a leader can you encourage people to uh, manage those emotions and then how as a leader can you also set an example for, for managing the emotional side of, of what's happening, whether it's the Ukrainian crisis or any other crisis? Um, first, I want to tie into that uh, decision making that has to be fast that Tatiana echoed and the fact that she was in the front lines because she was representative of the product and the product was also communicating to the internal teams and the outside teams that there was a care internally. That's, I, that's, I noticed that it's another theme at Slack so that sentiment of care has to be weaved into so many things, not only the, uh, the CEO or the people person, but also all the other departments have to echo the same kind of sentiments to make sure that the values are being presented in the right way. And funny enough, 
Tatiana, immediately when we saw that Ukraine was attacked, we put our uh, Ukrainian, our logo is now our, the Ukrainian colors mm. on our website immediately. There was no doubt about it in our minds that we were, um, we were going to make that change. Um, the emotional part and how to communicate that internally and how to communicate with the employees. I tend to be an open book, which is good and bad. Um, as as uh, you you said, uh, I, I haven't read Alisa's book, but I can imagine that that comes with pros and cons because if you give in to um, some of your worries, maybe those worries are ill placed at some point, or maybe they're considered as a question right now alarmist. Like, why is she worrying so much about Ukraine? What's what's really happening? Especially if you're in US and you're a little bit remote about it. So it comes with pros and cons. Being such an open book. I tend to journal a lot so that when I do have like a strong emotion coming up, I write it down and I fully understand where it's coming from, whether it's a trauma, whether it's a, uh, it comes from some misplaced uh, assessment of the situation. And I do a lot of um, discussions back and forth as well with my founder, who I find as a buffer to my strong emotions to make sure that what is it that I'm experiencing is real or I'm just imagining things. Um, but without that exposure of all the duality of emotions and the, 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 there's beauty in the diversity of emotions and the fact that for instance right now I feel very conflicted with so many things because it shows that it's okay to have those kind of range of, of, of things going on in, in one's life. And I think that there's something that we don't pay much attention to, which is Someone who comes to work spends a lot of hours into work, sometimes even more than they spend with their family. So for them, work is such an important place where they grow professionally, they grow their skill set, they become better human beings, and they it becomes such an important part of their life that if they're not in an environment where they feel that that growth is supported, um, they, they don't have many other places where they can go for, for that kind of trust. The political system in some governments is great, like in, in Norway, but in other countries that political system is dismantled or crazy, or it appears as being extreme in one place or another. Um, and sometimes even their families might not be there or might not have the, the kind of support that they need. And work is such an important, uh, the, the companies that they work for are becoming differently than they did 10 years ago. They're becoming the place where they also get some comfort in their growth and, and feeling safe and, and, and uh, getting to, to better themselves. So the dialogue that I'm hoping to have with, with our employees and with everybody is to make sure that they see that somebody understands that there's no black and white. There's also always some gray areas. Sometimes we might be on some extreme, sometimes on the other, some, sometimes in the middle, and we're going through this range of, of of, of emotions and actions and, and things of this nature. And I'm only able to communicate that effectively if I understand many perspectives. So when I go out and I post a message of some kind, I understand all the different things that they're going through and highlight that I understand where those things are coming for, from, where that point of view is, mm -hmm. is arising from so that they don't look at it from like on the political front. When a political leader goes on the stage, it's all black and white. It's us against them. It's them, they do it so, so bad and we're doing it so wrong. But the reality is never like that. People are not black and white. There are going to always be a range in, 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 uh, in on the spectrum. And by highlighting all the things that are happening, they can understand that it's okay to be somewhere on the spectrum. And we're all aiming to be better human beings. And we're all in it together, figuring out how to grow together as a team. Yeah, and yeah, absolutely. Safe there. No, thank you. Yeah, I mean, a few themes kind of, first of all, like constant communication again, um, but like acknowledging the emotions both in yourself through like the journaling practice and also in communications to the team. So that's really tactical and helpful for people. Thank you. I've got a couple of questions left and then we're going to turn it over to audience questions. So either pop those in the chat or in the uh, Q&A feature and Matt will uh, come and share some of those in a moment. Um, just two more from me then. Alyssa, you know, we touched on managing yourself or modeling you know, self-care, 
um, through this process. And you dedicate you know, the first third of your book to managing yourself um, because of its importance. So I'd just be curious if you had any tips to share on how people can look after themselves through this um, emotional time. Yes, definitely. You know, as a leader, if you're really being intentional about being a leader and what is what is required here, and also if you're really focusing on connected leadership, there is never more of a time where the cliche is correct. You've got to put your own oxygen mask on first, right? There's never a time that's more accurate. So I have sort of two sides to that. First of all, just to key off of something Alina talked about in terms of journaling and maybe having a safe space, you know, a partner of some sort to talk your emotions through with. The key is that you have your emotions, but that your emotions don't have you. Mm. And the way to have that sort of ability to have a little space between you and your emotions and is to journal about them and to maybe meditation or those kinds of things that help give you perspective. And that is key because otherwise you become impulsive and impulsivity and reactivity does not a connected and thoughtful leader make. Then the second thing I would say is really taking care of the asset and you are the asset and you need to show up for your team. So that comes back to such basics around physical self-care that we're, it's easy to sort of forget about, but it's really about the right nutrition, the right sleep, sleep is so important, the right you know, sort of move your body fitness routine of some sort and stress management and then having people around you that you feel personally connected to so that you have an emotional, you know, sort of fulfillment as well. Those are some of the basics of self-care that I think are essential at all times, but are also, but in particular are essential when you as a leader are being stretched and being called upon to both help others manage their emotions and help them be okay mm -hmm. in, in a time where maybe you're not okay. Mm -hmm. So it's about, you know, it's about that sort of that physical protection of yourself as well as finding the, the outlets and tools to make sure that your emotions are not having you and getting the better of you. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think your point is right on in that you need those healthy habits at all times, and then they really serve you when times get difficult. So things like journaling, exercise, meditation, good sleep, connecting with friends and family. Um, these are all things that perhaps sometimes get pushed to the side when we feel overwhelmed, but it's actually you know, the first things that we should be thinking about to look after ourselves. So the last question for me is for everybody, um, starting with Dawn, um, you know, what is one piece of advice that people can take away from this discussion um, or from your experience when it comes to managing through these crises, uh, sorry, managing through crises? Uh, what, what tip would you share? So the tip I was going to share is exactly what Alyssa just said, which is <laughs> care, for, care for yourself first. Um, I even had the oxygen mask analogy because it's such a classic. Like I'll use a, you can't pour from an empty cup. But what I will say is the, I, the yes and her point, when we show up as leaders and we actually are prioritizing ourselves, we're actually telling the team what is okay as well. Mm -hmm. If we show up as martyrs, as we show up as frazzled, if we show up as you know, um, trying to do it all for everybody, then we are signaling to them that that is what our expectation is for them as well. So I think, you know, and myself as a leader, as I've grown in my journey, I used to show up as that martyr that did everything for everybody and didn't care for myself. And then I was surprised when my team showed up in that same way as well. So I would say, if there's ever a moment where you think, oh, I'm being selfish or I shouldn't meditate or I shouldn't go for that walk, know that it does have the downstream implications to show your team what behaviors you value and that you're together and united. Yeah, absolutely. So modeling that. Thanks, Dawn. Tatiana. Yeah. Um, so I would say that, well, first of all, on the self-care thing, um, sure, go for a walk, right? But I think there's also an acknowledgement that life is not just like the same schedule every day over your entire lifetime that there are moments when sometimes people are just gonna need to work more. And then there are other times where people can take a break, right? So it's not right now, and I there's a question in the Q&A around, you know, why so much emphasis on self-care when we have over 3 million refugees, right? And, and people are really feeling, you know, what's the, like, when do we put an emphasis on compassion for others? And when do we put the emphasis on compassion for ourselves? 
So I, I think that there's, um, I think that it's, it's important for us to also as leaders understand that there are moments when maybe we do have to put a lot of things mm -hmm. uh, that we, we like to do um, uh, on the back burner, right? Because right now the moment needs us, right? And we need to step up as leaders um, in this moment and then take, you know, take the time later on to recover. Um, so that's, that's one thing. The other thing I would just say is um, don't discourage openness and disagreement. I think that there's a, um, what I worry about is that is when people feel like they can't say anything because mm -hmm. they're afraid that they're going to say the wrong thing. And the most important thing that we can say as leaders is to have empathy and compassion for points of view and allow people to express their points of view and other people to engage with them directly without shutting people down. Um, I think that's also one of the key things. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Tatiana. Um, Alina, any quick tips or takeaways? Just on mute there. On the self-care, I kind of understand it because for three weeks, I was even feeling guilty to leave my computer for the restroom. So I was in such an intense state and such and I was so wired. I felt like every WhatsApp message that I don't send, any telegram that I didn't send to somebody to get on that border or didn't get to that shelter would just put somebody in danger. I was such in a heightened state that I just collapsed. I couldn't I, I wasn't able to take action anymore. So I needed to go to sleep and I slept and it was amazing, but that's what I needed. I just needed sleep. Um, so sometimes it's just the little, little things um, mm -hmm. on the action. I agree with uh, Tatiana. I feel like it's such a important moment in time where speaking out and taking action, massive action needs to be needs to be taken because this is not okay people playing with people's life is not okay um and at the same time having that open discussion about what's going on in a way that is not aggressive towards in, uh, one another is also super important because i saw some people attacking russian restaurants in uh, in manhattan it makes no sense like what does that have to do with it like why are you showing aggression with aggression like Tit for tat is 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 mind-boggling. The Russia is not a war between Russia and Ukraine right now. It's a war, like Tatiana said, that just Putin's war. And showing the kind of compassion shows a counterexample to the beauty in human beings, the kindness that we can all express. But not everybody has the right tools to express their strong emotions and to uh, express their a difference of opinion without alienating the other you can do that there are books and then there's one book that i highly recommend non-violence communication in how to openly express yourself even if you have a very strong opinion towards the other without alienating them and speaking up even if you're speaking up against somebody who's much might have a higher rank or might have a higher pool being able to speak in an open forum in a way that allows you to take action without just being silent and do nothing. I think it's a, it's another important thing. And one, one, one last thing, as a leader, it's very important to understand everybody's point of view and understand the very variety of expression in order to be able to lead them. Because without that perspective, it's very, very hard to take one side or the other without understanding all the nuances. And I think that's like a, a key uh, thing that I've learned in the past couple of weeks, for sure. Yeah, thank you, Alina. Um, we're going to bring in Matt to walk through some audience questions in a second, but Alyssa, one quick tip or takeaway in 30 seconds. My, yeah, my, my quick tip or takeaway is, first of all, Tatiana, thank you for opening up a little bit of a shade of disagreement yourself here. And like we all learn better from shades of disagreement and having the conversations around a topic. But I guess the, the thing I want to add to this is be a person who can lead into uncomfortable conversations and hold that space as a leader, especially because you may not get it right, you may not get it perfect, but if you don't open the door, nobody will have the space to really 
say what's really going on with them. So you've got to learn to be that person, even though it's awkward and uncomfortable. Yep, totally agree. Thanks, Alyssa. Matt? Yeah, so we have several questions in the um, Q&A. Um, so the first one comes from Vitus. Um, and I think maybe this was tied to Tatiana's point that inaction is a type of action, but there are also business leaders that are disconnected um, who may not even acknowledge what's happening. Um, and so the question was, how do you draw attention to this war or crises without being labeled an alarmist? Anyone want to jump in? I think in on that there one? was a, a similar question from what I saw in the chat as well. Um, when people might just not want to talk about it because they're more closed. Um, I think it's very similar. Uh, similar yeah, question. I mean, so I think that the answer is, I believe it depends on whether it's said the CEO, right? Who is disconnected from it and is setting kind of a tone within the organization that nobody should talk about it um, versus an, a manager right? Versus someone who's impacted directly. For someone who's impacted directly, um, that also is, it depends. Uh, again, one of the people on my team, um, you know, nobody really, people thought that he didn't want to talk about it, but he, his native language is Russian. He just didn't want to talk about it in English because he didn't really know how to express himself. Um, so I talked to him in Russian. We had like a long conversation about it. Um, so that was, you know, because his manager couldn't talk to him about it in Russian. So there's that nuance, but there, you know, I would just say like, if people don't want to talk about it, don't, don't force them to. If it's a CEO, that's an interesting one. I mean, at some point, I think that the C-suite can have conversations with that person um, to, and especially the chief people officer um, and the head of HR can have a conversation with that person um, around their responsibility um, and how the employees are feeling, right? There must be some feedback mechanism in the organization to get information about employee sentiment to people in leadership, right? And can you use some of those mechanisms? I'd love to hear, you know, Dawn, if you know of, of situations like that or um, anyone else, like how, how do, what are the mechanisms, right? To get employee sentiment to the CEO and have them respond? So for us, um, you know, I'd be surprised there's a Slack channel. Mm -hmm. We have um, something called Slack AMA where our employees feel very free to ask us anything. And so it can be um, around when the Ukraine crisis happened, immediately there were questions. What are we doing? How are we addressing this? How can we support? What does it look like? It's a public channel. Um, so one is just that point around safe spaces and making sure feedback gets there. Is, is it anonymous, Don? Is I'm it sorry? anonymous? Or is it anonymous no. or? No, it's uh, people have their name attached to it, just like any Slack post. We also, um, not specifically around Ukraine, but when things, crisis do happen, social justice, wildfires, we there's something we use in Slack called Poly, which is, which is an anonymous, where you can tell us what is top of mind for you and what you care most about. And then we also have uh, all hands and events. Uh, we have weekly meetings, we have monthly meetings where employees can submit anonymous questions directly um, and ask and we answer them. Sometimes it can get really spicy, um, but that is something we're committed to as a company is to addressing it and to having that conversation. Um, so those are some of the ways that we, we do it. And candidly, people have no compunction to DM me or to message someone to get, make sure that feedback gets, gets posted up. So I think it is, as we've all been talking, you put the deposits in on the front end, and then people will tell you on the back end. The transparency and the corporate responsibility are becoming more and more prevalent and uh, values that people appreciate before they join a company and they pay attention a lot to that. Um, in the past, people would just join anybody who would give them a salary. Now they do their research properly on Glassdoor and everywhere. They ask the other employees, what is it like to work there? transparency is a big one, corporate responsibility is a huge one. And I think that leaders will feel more and more that impact uh, of being socially responsible and taking the proper action. So I think we'll see less and less of leaders that are being closed and not having an opinion one way or another. It happens, but it's they're going to 
have the peer pressure and they're just not going to be able to create the right organization. Maybe they might have other like-minded people who are just like business is business, but it's 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 not uh, that common anymore since remote and we're all kind of blending in work and and life uh, all together. Absolutely. I have <clears> one <throat> more question because I, I think we're low on time. Um, and I'm going to kind of change this around a little bit. Um, so this one's from Alejandro. Um, and I think this comes after maybe Alina's point about how misinformation can be rampant and how people kind of accept things maybe at face value sometimes. Um, but uh, as leaders, I, I think we're not immune to that either. And so uh, the question is, um, how as a leader, um, do you change your point of view without looking inconsistent or, or being too worried about looking inconsistent? Maybe the facts or the, the information you have has changed and now you're, you're trying to be unified, but, but also know that you've been inconsistent at this point. I can jump in on that if it'll be helpful. I mean, I think that I would just say transparency. I think that we all know smart people evolve their thinking. Communication is very helpful because when you over communicate, regularly communicate, people know where you stand. They also see possibly your evolution over time. And so showing your work, providing context um, and showing that evolution is super important. And if you're the CEO, you also need to bring your leadership team along and also make sure that your leadership team is doing their job, which is to be evangelizing and, and being the ambassadors of that communication throughout the ranks, but then also feeding back up, you know, back to mechanisms we talked about earlier, feeding back up to the CEO, how the employees are also feeling or perceiving. So you're con I think that a leader's job in some ways is constantly sort of um, tying off and reconnecting and recommitting and re-recruiting their people to various points of view and, where, and directions where we're going. Thank you all for your time today. Thanks, Matt. And thanks, panelists. Thank you, Dawn, Alina, Alyssa, and Tatiana. Very powerful discussion, very helpful as well. So thank you all.